Hello, everyone. I think we can then kick this off, uh, kick off this meeting uh, officially. Welcome to this RSEP topical meeting, um, where today I'm very happy that we have Marcelo Riga joining us, who will be talking about analysis workflows and specifically about Luigi analysis workflows. Uh, Marcel is a postdoc at the University of Hamburg, and uh, I recommend go check up his uh, check out his GitHub. There's not only the topic Luigi analysis workflows that we're talking about today. There's lots of other interesting stuff you can find out. Uh, over there as well, lots of other interesting projects. Um, and um, uh, Marcel, you're going, you, you have some slides, so we will get started with this. If you have questions in the meantime, uh, please do raise your hands and then we can uh, address those. And yeah, with that, uh, please take it away and uh, tell us all about analysis workflows and uh, specifically Luigi analysis workflows. Uh, you're muted right now. Nice. I think you can you can hear me now, right? Perfect. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So first of all, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to share my slides right now. I think you should be able to see them by now. Yes, all good. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'd like to work or to start with a um, with my personal motivation why I why I follow such a project. Um, so quite a while ago, actually nine years ago, at the end of my master thesis, I was doing TTH for CMS. Um, everything was working well. I had three weeks until the deadline came when I should hand in. And yeah, a couple of days really before handing in, there, there was a huge bug really affecting the selection. So something really, really early in the, in, let's say in the workflow, I think one can't call it workflow or one couldn't call it workflow back then but very early um, in a very early stage of the analysis really affecting the entire thing so yeah it, it affected it definitely would have would have affected the results so i had to really run everything from scratch and then really from the during the next 16 days i was basically living only for the analysis basically the, the analysis was running me instead of the other way around um starting things in quick succession, setting alarms during the night, waking up, of course, either one hour earlier or one hour late, um, starting things again, estimating when the next jobs or tasks or whatever would have been finished. And yeah, this this was a mess. And after that um, torture, um, I, I didn't want to do this anymore like that. And I started to come up with a workflow system based on, of course, existing things, but adapting this for HEP. And this is what I want to talk about today. Okay, so first of all, I'll, here I'd like to start with some motivational questions uh, regarding portability, reproducibility, and preservation. So regarding portability, I think the questions here would be whether a, an analysis depends on where it actually runs or where it stores the data. And I think the answer here should be that execution and storage should not dictate anything in the code design, in the actual design of the analysis algorithms. Then regarding reproducibility, for example, when a postdoc PhD student leaves, um, the questions here would be, can someone else the analysis or is there a loss of information? Or this is, I think the worst, worst case is a new framework, quote unquote, framework required. And I think there, very often the answer is yes, because the dependencies between very particular things and an analysis really only often only exist in, in, our, in our heads. And then the last part regarding preservation, after something is published, a huge analysis is published, let's say, are people actually investing time to preserve their work or can it be repeated after months, even weeks or years? Um, I think there the answer is very often, not always, but very often, no. And I think this uh, this also should be changed. And I think one of the answers here could be that the daily working environment that you anyway use already while prototyping and running the analysis, this environment should already provide preservation features out of the box. Maybe not full preservation. I think that's, that's at least for now, maybe too hard, but some really, really key features should be provided out of the box. And then from my personal experience, um, very often, 
uh, when running an analysis, I think two thirds of the time, very, very often are just gone for technicalities and maybe a third, and this is an estimate of course, but maybe a third is left for physics. And my question here to myself very often is, would the physics output be doubled if it were the other way around? And I like to think that it's that the case and it's a big motivation to, to really follow such a project. Um, when we talk about analysis, I think this is a nice visualization of of, of one, but I mean, it, it's quite old. It's really an excerpt of, of what the full analysis would look like. This is from a previous TTPP cross-section measurement that I was involved in. And this is really showing just a fraction of, of what's actually happening there. But every of these ellipses here is a particular workload in this entire workflow. And each connection here would be something like information flowing from from one to another workload. This can be a file or just, let's say, a weight or something or a factor. But most most of the times, this in this case, these were these were files, and all these connections from where do they go? Where do they connect? Where is what needed? This is um, what I meant in the beginning. What we really very very often only lives in in the physicist head. Um, there are scripts that connect that, but then there's status, there's there's versioning, there's quick fixes, hot fixes. I mean, this is this can be a mess, and I think this illustrates it um, very nicely. And then maybe going before going into the topic, let's maybe first go one step back. Um, I think as as many of or as all of us know, most analysis nowadays are really large scale and also very very complex. I mean, both complexity and scale can be attacked with, for example, a good coding structure, good scripting, or using very, very performant um, scaling uh, compute infrastructure. But the combination of the two is again where it's where it's complex or, or where it's where it's um, yeah just complicated because the structure and requirements between these workloads are, mo are mostly undocumented. Then there's this issue of manual execution and the steering of jobs, bookkeeping of data, um, very often across different storage elements, data revisions. And I think this entire thing is error prone and very, very time consuming. At the end of, of the thesis that I was mentioning in the beginning, I think we had like 74 different, unique, different um, systematic uncertainties. So the entire thing or just part parts of the entire analysis had to be run this many times. And I mean, this was just job sitting hell in the end. So in the following, um, I'd like to uh, explain you the concept of what Luigi is doing to attack the complexity part of things and to enable this on a large scale. Um, I want to mention law as, as one option to do that. But again, first, before really going into the details there on these two packages, I just want to show or flash this comparison because there are already existing workflow management systems um, in HEP today. Um, this is one example, Monte Carlo production, where there's a very, let's say, tailored system. The structure is known in advance. For example, this would be a super um, simplified picture of what is done in CMS in the, for the different steps. I, I don't think one has to go into detail here. It's just... A picture showing um, that the structure here is, let's say, static and recurring. Its design is one-dimensional. Um, this very often runs on special production infrastructure, uh, where everything is really tailored towards running this particular uh, workflow, and also software requirements are very, very often homogeneous. While as for end-user analysis, I think the wish list is really, really orthogonal. Uh, the structure is rather iterative. It's developed while running it, I think, a priori unknown. Uh, the workflows are dynamic and they have to be fast R&D cycles. Um, instead of this, this 1D design, uh, this should be a very, very complex direct, um, directed uh, acyclic graph with really arbitrary dependencies. And also, and really not to forget this, the infrastructure where this is running or where it's it's storing, this should work on any infrastructure there is no usually no tailored system um, and also one wants of course to use custom software and one this and, and run this everywhere so as you can see the requirements here are really really different okay so first part really attacking the complexity part of things with luigi um, luigi is a python package for for building complex pipelines um, they've developed and started at spotify but it's now fully open source and community driven. Um, you can see this here on the right hand side. Um, it's really well supported and well accepted by the community. 
What I like most about Luigi is that it's at the core is extremely simple. It just has these three main building blocks. So the workloads that I was talking about before, they are defined as so-called task classes. And task classes can require other tasks or other task yeah, classes in, in that sense. So this is basically already building this uh, this graph structure. Tasks can produce so-called uh, produce so-called targets. Um, most of the time, targets would be files or directories, but in, in, in fact, it can be anything which can either exist or not. Like database entry can also be a target. So this can be also produced. And then at the end, there are parameters that would that can customize tasks and control the runtime behavior in a very very Pythonic way. And then on top of that, there's a lot of other features. I, I wouldn't count them as being part of the core of Luigi, but some of them are really helpful, like this, this user interface shown here on the right-hand side. We will also see this, see an example of that at the end, when I show a very quick demo of that. Um, automatic error handling, history, browsing, and very, very many yeah, collaborative features and the command line interface to run things. Um, one very, very appealing part about it is that the, execu the, the execution model of Luigi is, is make-like. We can see a workflow here on the right-hand side. So I'm um, also not going into detail what this actually does, just the structure is important. So at the top, there's um, the task that one would trigger. So one would not run this entire thing and define this entire graph here as the, the target of, of as the, um, the, the, the workflow that should be run, but one, triggers a specific task. And then what Luigi does in the background, it basically builds up this dependency tree depending on all different dynamic behavior, like really runtime and ver environment variables, parameters, everything can be included there to make this decision, which task depends on which other task. And then when this task structure is built, um, it's just working um, bottom up, basically determining which of the tasks don't need to be run, which are complete already. And by definition, a task is complete when its outputs exist. I mean, this is fully like in make. Um, and then Luigi would just start processing this tree from, from bottom to top until the point where the target or the output of the task that was actually triggered exists. And by that, it of course, only processes what's actually really necessary. It's super scalable through um, this, this very simple structure. And these error handling and automatic rescheduling features are also very, very helpful in that sense. Um, just don't want to flash too much code here, but just to show that this one slide here contains 85, 90% of what you really need to know about Luigi. Really, it's it's in a nutshell going really just super quickly through it. Here you would, for example, see one of these task classes and what it actually needs to do is de de derive or inherit from this um, this the central task coming shipped with Luigi. Then it has three functions that one should implement. Not always, but in most cases, one should implement these three, which is defining the requirements, defining the output, and defining what what's actually uh, what's actually the workload, what should be run. Um, and then there's also one parameter. In this case, it's I just added the data set as an example, which has some default value. But when you call this from the command line you can actually just choose a different value for that. So th this is really just the the, um, the default and this directly translates into a into this command line interface. And then in the requirement, you would return another task, for example, in some other part of your code or your project, you define the selection task, which is required to run the reconstruction. Um, and yeah, you would, you would just define it and return it. In the output, you would define a so-called local target. This is a Luigi class, a Luigi target class. And there you would maybe want to de to, de to encode the, the selected data set into the output location so that consistently when running, for example, with a different data set value for the data set parameter, um, Luigi can decide whether this has been already run or not. And then in the run block, you would just yeah, one whatever you need to do in the reconstruction, you have access to the input. And also just logically speaking, the input is the output of the requirements. So here would you have the output of selection. You define basically the output target that you want to produce, and then you just do it. And being Python, um, you can, or being in Python, you can of course quickly break out of Python and call your macros that you define somewhere else so that 
code definition and really task definition or algorithm definition and workflow definition is, is separated and you're good to go. Okay, this is an example of uh, a dependency tree. This was the work of a bachelor student a couple of years back after after two weeks. So we provided him with, uh, at this time, these, these tasks here, which are shown in green. They were already done. And then he started working. And two nice things about that. I mean, the structure is complex. Um, this was some machine learning application. But after these two weeks, um, the bachelor student could actually see what he was doing there. And then also for us supervisors, we could actually see what he's doing there. So this was really a win-win situation there. And we can really follow what he was doing. And it was just a nice to have. Okay. Finishing here with Luigi. Now let's get to the scale part with law. First of all, law does not replace Luigi. Law is just an extension on top of it. As I said, Luigi is... Um, the core of Luigi is very minimal and it's very, very easy to extend it. And I think also many projects also in HEP have already done that. Um, then in law, the design really followed uh, three primary goals. So first one is to be experiment agnostic. I mean, I am in CMS, but there is no sign of CMS in the core of law. And in fact, it's not even related to anything in HEP or in physics. Um, then with, um, let's say, packages outside of the core, it should provide scalability on the infrastructure that we have access to. But again, it's not limiting itself to it. It's just giving you the the, the, the opportunities or the, the options to use it, but you don't have to use it. You can also use other infrastructures. I'm coming to this um, on, on some later slides. And then, and this is the main, the, the main design goal here is that with law, um, what you can do is you can actually decouple run locations, storage locations, and software environments. Um, so each of these parts here is really interchangeable. If you run the same thing and want to store your outputs someplace else, you can you can do that without changing anything there. Just 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 changing the the uh, let's say the storage element in in the backend, or just store stuff locally. This is all possible without touching anything here. Um, if you're running on I don't know your local cluster, and one day. Um, there is there is a network outage or something. You can just decide to submit to some other cluster if you have access to that. This should also be possible without changing anything there. Um, it's not constrained to specific resources, as I said, and all components are really interchangeable. And by that, it's basically a toolbox uh, that allows you to follow a design pattern for analysis. And by that, it's not a yeah, it's not a framework. I I, I don't think it qualifies as a framework because there is also no constraint on the actual language of your, let's say, workloads that you start or on any data structure that is being passed around because you can really pass around anything that you like. Um, and yeah, as I said, I started with that roughly nine or eight years ago. And by now it's uh, at least in CMS because I'm in CMS. Um, it's, it's the most used workflow system for analysis with I think roughly 20 analysis being covered, at least the ones that I know of and reaching i think by by now something between 60 and 80 people but this is also a a guess the 80 is a guess um and it's also in cms being used in central groups like the gem group hicks group um, tau group for pre-processing for their machine learning models for training uh, tau identification uh be taking groups yeah okay so now going super quickly through the these uh, three blocks these, these uh, three main features so first of all, job submission. And here, the idea is that the submission is built into the tasks and there's no need to write any extra code. Uh, currently supported are several batch systems, um, HD Condor, LSF, Chilite Arc, and Slurm. And for CMS people, crap is hopefully also coming soon. So using this uh, CMS remote analysis um, builder interface basically just as a mechanism the piggyback mechanism to bring the jobs to the grid um, without really having to know how, how this is done. It's just a transport system then. It has many mandatory features such, such, as, uh, such as automatic resubmission, but also flexible job task matching. Um, jobs still are fully configurable at submission time. I mean, the submission systems or the, the, the compute, uh, computing elements are, of course, very, very... It's a inhomogeneous 
Um, and I think it for, for such a tool, it would be wrong to, to, to apply some magic to make it somehow automatically work. I think this, this would be the wrong approach. So they're good defaults, but everything is still fully configurable at, at submission time. Um, there's also some internal job staging, for example, when queues are saturated and really the, the, the list goes on. These are just the most important features. And here is one screenshot sh shown from the HD Convert. So an example, you can click on it and really just run it if you have access to the um, to X Plus and the, and the batch here at CERN. Uh, here you would, for example, start something, start a task, um, which is which is called like that, and you would add submission time, define where it should run. In this case, on HD Condor, it would submit jobs as part of a sp of, the, of the specific tasks, it's going to this status polling phase when all the jobs are done. Like in this case here, it would just return to the next task. So we need this submission status polling and continuing. This is really just part of the workflow. This is not what you execute there. If one task decides it has to do that, then it does it. And then the rest continues. Uh, like shown here on this right side. This is just, can be what just one part of it. Um, I mean, this was a super trivial example. For example, for the last CMS Dihex combination, uh, we used it as well um, to get all the fits basically running for, for this de tight deadline of this nature paper um, for the 10 year, um, 10 year anniversary. And this is just an example showing that this is also really going, going large scale or enabling large scale. This was really many thousand jobs. I think at the end, something like 50,000 jobs. And this is was still very, let's say, easy to manage um, in, in this very automatic fashion. Then the second block, which are the remote targets. So here, the, the idea is to work with remote files completely as if they were local. And um, there are remote targets or file targets built on top of these GFAL2 Python bindings. Um, by that, all the WLTG protocols are essentially automatically uh, supported, XWRT, DevX, Squid FTP, and so on, plus Dropbox. Um, and the, the key idea there is that the API of the targets, we can see some examples in the following, are completely identical to local ones. So most of the time, for example, in our condal analysis um, in CMS that, that we are doing in our group, when really interacting with these targets or with the files, it's it's not even necessary to know whether they are local or remote. They feel the same, they act the same, and sometimes they're really both. It's 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 really not necessarily not necessary anymore to know where they're located. And this is actually the purpose of them. And also just a note here, um, this GFile Python bindings, this is also just a choice. It's a good default. It's also fully exchangeable. This is not part of the core. For example, FS spec, uh, the integration of SS, uh, FS spec is, is easily possible by just right, basically implementing a certain remote file interface and that's it. Again, there are many mandatory features like these automatic retries in case of, let's say, network glitches, local caching, which is a topic on its own. And I think I could talk 30 minutes about that topic alone. Um, there are some slides in the backup if you're interested, but I'm skipping this for now. Uh, configurable protocols, round robin, and so on. And for example, to use it, this is one example here. In your main config, you would just define this WSG file system where the base path is, and this is actually the minimal requirement to work with remote files. In this case, I would point this to my uh, personal EO space at CERN. And then when this is defined, I can, for example, define just this WLCG file target, um, then try to access the file called file JSON. Here define or here basically um, describe that I want to use this particular file system and then work with the file if, is, is, as uh, if it were local in a, in a very Pythonic way. So here, for example, opening it, loading it to JSON. I mean, this is super, this is the, the, the most elementary case, I think. Um, there are also convenience methods for doing these very, very common operations. Um, for example, these data loading, uh, these, these loaders for, for example, here for these recurrent tasks like JSON formatting. Um, this can also work with larger files, for example, here opening a root file. And again, I mean, we, we know this line here, but this can also be any other target, like a Dropbox file or a local file. The part here at the bottom does not change. It would load it with the root formatter, which opens the root file and gives you the context in a context, and then you can just work with it. Um, again, 
an example showing, for example, opening a TensorFlow graph and just directly running it. And there's running so much in the background, just to highlight this very, very briefly here. This is a really a screenshot from a uh, from from our current analysis. Um, you would, for example, just get the input. The input is now, let's say, a uh, gzipped file. And for example, when using this in, in CMS, we have this correction lib, um, which expects the, the the text basically behind this g this 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 zipped file. You would just call uh, input load formatted gzip. And this is it. And when the file is remote, what's happening in the background is, is if it's remote, it's downloading it first. If local caching is enabled, and I think this this should be, always be the default, it puts it into this into this local cache for later use. If it's not already there, if it's already there, it does nothing, and then it opens the file, decompresses it, and gives you the content. And this just in in this let's say half half of a line. Okay, coming to the third block, feature block, which is environments and boxing. And um, I think it's fair to say that diverging software requirements between very, very typical workloads can be a great feature, but it can also be a challenge or even a problem. Um, incompatibilities between um, C libraries, uh, compilers, this, this, yeah, this, this can all end up in a mess. And this is why uh, law introduces a feature called sandboxing. And here, the idea is that a, an entire task can be really put or run in a completely different environment. Um, you can see this, for example, here on the right hand side. This is the graph that we've seen before. And what one can define on a per task level, and one can also parameterize it if one wants to, uh, saying that this task here should run in a Docker image A, this next one should run in a Docker image B, or the previous one rather. The This task here should run in a subshell with this init script. And this init script can, of course, set up anything that, that you like it's 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 just calling the script and then we're using the environment con environment of course as well uh singularity containers this is what's what's currently supported and yeah i think this is one of the let's say most basic features i think in most analysis one really wants to do that um yeah it, it, it just it just works like that it's the, the mechanism is actually quite simple in the background but nevertheless quite helpful um and then because we, we, we've seen this code example before i now want to transform this luigi task into into the law task by checking these boxes up here so right now this is a luigi task with with the features that we've seen before to make it a law task one will now actually see two changes the inheritance will change because we're not inheriting from the basic law uh, luigi task but from the basic law task which is almost the same with a a little bit of yeah with a couple of convenience methods let's say and it's also using a a different file impl file target implementation and when i go down this is exactly what's changing what's changing the rest is completely the same parameter it, it, it's the same um so this is not a local file target and this is not inheriting from the law task now running things on condor just requires you to inherit something in in, in addition namely this law hd condor workflow um there will be an example later uh, demonstrating workflows or there, there will be a link to an example later demonstrating these workflows uh, but in its core it's really as simple as that and then if one wants to store on eos one really just needs to change the target definition here it's not just a local file target anymore but a wlcg file target and this is it Okay, there is no code implementation here showing how to use the, the, the output, so the target, but trust me when I say this is nothing here changes at all. And then when running in Docker, two things now again change. This is inheriting from the so-called sandbox tasks, so anything that can be put in a sandbox. And then here hard-coded um, is the, the name of, this, of the sandbox. And yeah, this is, this is basically it, just with a few line changes. Um, this this task now um, obtained these these features here listed. Okay. Then to start tasks, um, we've seen this on the previous slide at the bottom, but I want to mention this here again. Um, there are several triggers to do that. For example, yeah, I think in most of the cases, one one, one wants to run things from the command line because this is actually where one really works on a large scale productively. 
um, one can just do that. I mean, there's this command that interface law, uh, which is this run sub command, and then you can just put here the name of the task that you want to run, and then have your parameters here. Um, qu quite simple, but also this this law run command has a full auto completion um, of all the tasks that it can find in your code and all the in all its parameters. Um, you can script with it and mixing, um, for example, task execution and, and complete these checks with you know, with your custom scripts. And this is a very easy interface. Um, to existing tasks for just doing prototyping work. For example, here triggering this, this task and all the things that I've just mentioned before, all the tree building, dependency checks until the point where the task output is existing. You can load it. In this case, it's a parquet file. Uh, you load it with the awkward formatter and ju just do whatever you want to do with it. And yep, it, it, it works like that out of the box. And then there's also notebook support. Um, you can click here on this on this uh, notebook on, on binder. Um, this is also showing a small example. This particular example I will also show on the following slides uh, interactively. But this this is how it would look like when working interactively with uh, with law. For example, doing status checks just to see what is actually there, what would be uh, hypothetically be running if I would start things. And uh, yeah, this uh, this this can be quite helpful. Okay, I think we have time for a quick demo. Um, so the task that, or the task or the workflow um, that I would like to jump into now is is quite simple. Or the, the payload is quite simple. So what it does, it is it fetches six paragraphs of this uh, lorem ipsum placeholder text from from some server. So six files. The task is called fetch lorem ipsum, and there are six of them. Or this the, the number here is actually a parameter. Then in the second task, um, which also has this parameter here, um, the character frequencies are counted and they're saved uh, to a JSON file. In a third task, those JSON files are collected, like, like let's, let's call it a map reduce like approach. Um, they're collected in a single JSON file and summed up. And then at the end, there's a task that prints their frequencies. It doesn't have an output on its own. It just prints the overview of the frequencies. I'm showing the CLI usage in the following, but um, as I said before, just if, if you want to check it out on your own, there's also the notebook version of this particular example. I quickly stop sharing and move on to my other screen, just a second. Can you see my screen? Hopefully also yes. large enough. Yep, um, looks good. Okay, perfect. So if you open the example, you will see this tasks file. This is actually the only file that's, that's yeah necessary for that. And here are the four tasks, tasks that I mentioned before. I hope you can see them. I uh, folded the code just for better um, visibility here. There's this fetch task, which fetches the, the text file, the count charts task, merge counts, and show frequencies. And then here on the command line on the right hand side, uh, my point is now here. Um, I'm going into this example directory and set it up. It's quickly fetching Luigi, but this should be it. It's now set up, and I can, for example, first check which tasks can be found when scanning this um, this file here on the left. This is basically already um, set into the config. So when, what one just has to do is call the indexing. And this is just only necessary for having auto completion. One doesn't need that, but if one wants to have yeah, this very, very convenient uh, auto completion, for example, in cases where you have, I don't know, 50 different parameters of a task, then it's nice to know which, which exists without looking into the code. So I'm scanning this and it gives me an overview of which task it's scanned in this tasks module here. Right? The, task, the file on the left is called tasks.py and that's it. It just writes a file with the, just this meta information about the tasks. And again, it's not necessary just for having this auto completion. And then I can basically select what I want to run. Let's, let's maybe do things a bit slowly first. I'm fetching this, this lorem ipsum text one so file index is actually a parameter of it i can 
tap tap here to, to see the auto completed uh, suggestions. And I mean, there are some that come with this Luigi base task, log base task. But for example, this file index parameter here is the one that I want to use now. It's file index one. Okay, so if I would start that, or if I would trigger now, this uh, would run the task. But before doing that, very, very often, it's very helpful to see what it would run hypothetically. And for that, there are these interactive parameters that you can also see above here. For example, status printing, um, it requires a number. What the number is, I'm going to explain later. In this case, it's it's zero. And then you can see, okay, when I run this, this exact command, um, it would basically provide the, the the output of this task here. This is the fetch, fetch lorem ipsum task with this file index set to one. If I run it, there's some output of the Luigi interface that it's building the task tree, which is existing just of this one task in this instance. It's running this task. I mean, of course it's super fast. It's done with the task and that's it. If I now print the status again, so the same command as before, I now see that the output target, this local file target at this data path here is actually existent. So now I can, for example, run the second task. And this is the count chars task. Again, this one has this file index one um, because yeah, there's one of these tasks per texts. Um, to show this map reduce like structure, I again run it first with this print status flag, and then I can see that it's absent. And now I set this level here to one, and this is actually the the recursion level. So if I put here print status one, it shows me the output of the task that I'm triggering here of the status, and also the first level of dependencies. In this case, the fetch lorem ipsum for file index one is existent, while the one for count chars is not. When I run it, it only runs the count chars command. Okay, this is, has now gone a bit a bit quick here um, because there's, there's not a big payload uh, happening in the background, but it's only running this count chars and nothing else. I can, I can also show this by using a different file. So now if I do, do, the same, do the same thing here, it shows me for the second file, the second of the six files, um, both tasks are actually incomplete at the moment. So I can just run both of them. And now when quickly browsing over the output here, I can see that this fetch task actually went first and then the count jars task run. I can again run this and now with the third file, um, and now just for this visualization or this demonstration purposes at the slow parameter, which gives, which adds some, delay before running and then it's it's a bit easier to see what's actually happening there so it's running this fetch lorem ipsum task and then the second one and also now for demonstrate uh, demonstration purposes this is uh, maybe a bit even too slow so i'm running both again like that okay now when i would run this merge counts task here on the left which would be the next in line and remember we only ran two and a half of them yet not all of them, all of the files, but of course this doesn't matter because the dependency tree buildup should be of course fully recursive and everything should be run in order to provide the result of the task that I just triggered. So if I directly run merge counts and first again, go with print status, this time with level two, or I can also just put minus one, I can see what's actually happening here. So this is the task that I want to trigger. And because there are these six files, we have these six blocks here, one, two, three, four, five, six. And each of them consists of these two parts. So this is exactly the graph that I showed you before on the slide. And here one can see that, okay, actually three of them are actually done and three are not. So I can just run it again. And now the three remaining ones have been processed. Again, I can check this with this status printing. Maybe now just going um, uh, going down for one recursion level in the tree. And it shows me that now these, these merge tasks are done. And I can finally run the last one, which is show frequencies. And this would be the result of that. 
So what I what I did now is I manually ran all the tasks basically, um, yeah, one by one. If I again show the status with this level, I can see okay, there's now a bit more output, but I think it should still fit here on the right hand side, and they're all existent. But sometimes I also just want to rerun something, right? And and in this instance, I would like to remove things. And there are actually many parameters or many interactive parameters for doing that. For example, remove output. And it and expects also a recursion level. Putting minus one here is, of course, can be dangerous. We still do that because uh, by default, this is going into an interactive mode because yeah, removal can be super dangerous. And when can just go through it one by one, remove outputs, yes, yes and so on. I can also just do this and delete everything because in this instance, I'm knowing uh, exactly what I'm removing and now it's all removed. And again, this can also be remote remote things. It, it's, it, it works the exact same way. Um, going again for printing this status with some recursion depth. And now we see that in fact, everything here is removed. Um, and then I can, for example, also just run everything again, but this time not serially or not um, with one core, let's say, running the task in the tree, but with many cores. And this is the worker parameter. For example, I want to use, use uh, three of the cores that I have. And in this case, it just wouldn't would run them yeah, rather quick in this instance. Okay, are there any questions to this example? Okay, if not, I will just continue with the last two slides. Um, stopping sharing again. And I think you should be able to see the slides again. Yep. And again, I mean, this was a very, very simple example. There are also examples showing, for example, the usage of HD Condor at CERN or some Slurm examples. Um, feel free to check them out. This particular one can also be launched in the notebook version. Um, and then also maybe one example, and this is now, let's say, accelerating a bit, but um, this this particular example is from our current way we're doing analysis in our group, um, large scale analysis, um, with a package called column flow. This is basically using law and some, some other packages um, to build these large large, let's say, dependency trees or large task structures um, to create a structure that really covers really, really large and really, really complex analysis, for example, DIHIX uh, things or top mass measurements with uh, CMS. And the idea here is that columns are, are read and written only really if necessary um, to, to optimize I.O., um, columns are created and merged with, with existing ones really only at the latest possible instance. So this entire graph here on the right-hand side, this is a law graph or a law task graph um, showing just the most important bits of it. There are many more, but these are the, the core parts or the core tasks of the analysis. Um, and each of them can, for example, create or write certain columns it's it's not really processing everything in, in, in one go, but really opportunistically, only when it's needed and merging things and reading things only at the instance when they're needed. There are some examples. There's one example on the next slide. Um, it's, and I think this is, for example, with Coffea processors in mind, um, the, the, the biggest difference is I think that one can store immediate outputs or that it's it's built around storing immediate intermediate outputs, for example, from for computations downstream for sharing results of of the same computations across groups, um, for applications like machine learning that require prevent info, uh, studies done by students and obviously debugging purposes, um, makes heavy use of bare numpy TensorFlow in, in awkward um, operations plus coffee object behavior, which is I think absolutely necessary at this at this stage. Um, the example on the next slide that I want to show you is the full resolution of systematic uncertainties. Uh, but also I want to mention here that when looking into the ATTF report, uh, there's this, an analysis wish list from the CMS point of view. 
And this approach, I think, checks all of the points there, or let's say almost all of the points there. And um, yeah, I, I think I think this is this is really exciting because at the end you can just trigger a single task, leave your computer for yeah, a short amount of time. Hopefully, we 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 aren't at timing um, at timing measure time measurements yet. But you can you can just leave and everything is processed, and this is really working for a huge huge analysis with in the order of eighty to ninety uncertainties. Okay, and then really on the last slide here, showing just this one example of this automatic resolution of uncertainties. So this is this is the graph um, suggested by Column Flow. It's fully customizable still, but this is the let's say default way of doing analysis with it. There's the final results that I want to trigger, and then of course up here you would find the initial tasks. And again, the exact structure is not that important for now. Um, this is just just detail, but just the 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 let's say the direction of how to read this okay so now when for example running the let's say nominal analysis one would just trigger let's say i don't know plotting some some nominal plots without uncertainties and the entire thing runs for all the data sets um maybe for different let's say configurations for data data, data taking periods uh, for example three different years or so with just the nominal version of it but I mean, what happens, for example, when I also want to run different certain samples with a different generator tune or different jet energy calibrations, uh, or I don't know, so some different pileup weights, right? These are three different types of uncertainties, actually. And the key idea here is to, I mean, to prevent running everything from scratch, uh, where it clearly shouldn't, or there's no need for that. The key idea here is that the tasks really know which uncertainties they a they implement themselves and b uh, which they depend on so what is happening upstream in the tasks that i require recursively upstream so for example for this tune uh, for this tune uncertainty um usually there are different monte carlo samples produced by that for that um, I'm not talking about those who can be covered by weights, but really just different events. And for them, I mean, yeah, we, we can't do anything else but running them from, from beginning to end. But again, only those um, that have that uncertainty. Then there's, for, for example, jet energy calibrations. And these only affect or start affecting the analysis beginning at the event selection. All these initial tasks up here, that are not affected by that. So we can already save this block here. And when you have many of them, this block here is really, really important. And then there are, for example, uncertainties like pileup weights. And those weights usually only make sense uh, when, when looking at histograms. And the task in our case here, which creates histograms, is that one here. So all of them only affect the analysis here and down from here. Everything up here is not affected by them, right? If the tasks know that, and yeah. In our case, they do. One can save this entire, um, these these entire all, the, all these branches of processing, and this can be very very beneficial. Um, for example, what we did, I mean, for the last let's say five months, yeah, I want to say five months, we developed this tool, and then within two weeks, we basically branched off four analysis in parallel. They are of course not completely done, but I, I would say eighty percent of them are done with just, yeah. A minimal amount of code needed for that and implementing all the uncertainties just in parallel is is is, is just fairly fairly trivial with that okay and this brings me then to my summary um so i think a resource agnostic workflow management is really really essential for analysis that are both large and complex and i think there's the need for this flexible type of analysis design pattern luigi is able to model um, in a very pathonic way, very, very complex workflows, while Luigi, uh, while law extends it uh, in a fully experiment agnostic way. And in this way, yeah, I mean, scalability is of course achieved, but there's also a full decoupling of, of run locations, storage locations, and also software environments. Um, everything becomes transparently encoded, and it also enables an end-to-end -end automation for analysis over distributed opportunistic resources. And it also allows to build workflows, uh, frameworks that um, are able to check every point, for example, in the CMS analysis wishlist. 
And of course, collaboration and contributions are super welcome. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Marcel. That's uh, a very nice overview and a very impressive uh, project as well. Um, let's start taking questions, Gordon. Yeah, uh, really, really nice talk. Um, and as usual, just an insane amount of work. Uh, a couple of a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, I was going to ask, but maybe you've already answered. But it looked like the only inputs and outputs were basically file based, some you know small small strings and other things like that. But it sounds like Cutflow, which is built on top of Law, I believe, not on top of uh, Luigi, but you know, Luigi's a couple of levels down. It sounds like you were talking about having um, awkward arrays and other things as results that were uh, cached by the workflow system. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, yeah. These uh, okay. handling of text files, these were really just examples, but gigabytes of, of input files, this is also, I mean, this is the default actually. Right. Uh, actually, I didn't mean uh, input files. Like as you go through, the stages in Cutflow, I, I assume the handoff are basically, uh, for most of those things, awkward arrays of one sort or another. Does each of those boxes write out a, explicitly write out a awkward array file, or is that handled by the Cutflow infrastructure? So the user never worries about temporary files. They just worry about, I don't know, the awkward arrays or whatever that they're uh, working with. Yeah, so sorry when when I said input files, uh, I, I really didn't mean the the files that the analysis is starting from. But I mean, it's mm -hmm. the default case for law for handling files is really gigabytes of, of large files. This is let's say the default okay. in law. In this column flow yeah. package, um, yeah, mm -hmm. there we made the decision um, that most of the tasks would produce awkward errors in parquet file structure. Okay, and the so files every... are passed around. Okay, so every single task in that task diagram you have starts with a you know awkward dot from parquet or something like that and it ends with an awkward dot to parquet or, or the moral equivalent exactly it's abstracted okay. but in 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 essence yeah. yes yes okay okay great um the other thing is is uh you mentioned that law was uh you know you experiment agnostic uh how about column flow is that is that something you know out on GitHub that one can look at and adapt for other environments, or is that uh, got CMS baked into it? It's uh, it's on GitHub. Um, I have to think, but no, CM CMS is not really that much baked into it. Some of the tasks have this um, have a CMS. Let's call it flavor. Let's yeah, say of course this this first well, one here personality. Yeah, it's the core framework I'm talking about. You know, my, the some of the modules and common tasks are are certainly you know the yeah. personality will be CMS. Okay, and then the last question was no, no, no. Sorry, just 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 uh, to be very very sure about this point. So it's it's just in this case really this particular task here, which has uh, CMS written into it, but the rest is had has uh, nothing to do with the CMS actually. Sure, sure, and and most importantly the core framework has nothing to do with uh, CMS. That part is agnostic. Yeah, um, yeah. And then the very last question was, you made a reference to uh, working in analysis groups, which to, to me meant you were able to share intermediate results. So if one person ran, you know, if you, you're all starting from uh, actually, I have one more question after this, but it'll be quick. If you're all starting from uh, a common task graph, which is you know very expensive in the beginning end, processing stuff with the HT Condor jobs and running off of raw files to to entuplize the files, et cetera, but everybody downstream now, the whole group can use the results of that. That says somehow this cache that you've got that uh, Luigi or whatever is using to cache the results is shared amongst. Uh, an analysis group. And I was just wondering how that worked. Is that like a shared file system? Is it, you know, what, what how does that work? Yeah, actually everything what is necessary for that is just that there's the file system. You can, I mean, you're free to choose what, what you like there. Uh, for example, in this, let's, let's consider EOS. Um, if your files are configured to write their files, uh, their, their output in a, certain with, with certain file names into that base directory 
then other groups can of course use it if they have the the same let's say encoding of parameters into into output names they just reuse it okay it's it's Perfect. really sharing on a file system level and i mean this is okay. rather not a config of of law but this is how groups can can organize it really translates yeah. very yeah transparently into using file systems right right so everybody just has to use a common you know resource be it you know yeah, some for, sort of a file system that's accessible by everybody that's uh in yeah, your for, analysis. for some tasks exactly. yeah, yeah not necessarily yeah. for all but for the most important ones for the right for the really expensive ones right and then the very yeah. last question i'm I, I apologize alex hopefully this one will be quick was you made some reference to uh to notebook uh integration um let's uh just just to make sure uh that that the notebook integration is actually what i think it is let's say uh you know you're working with uh your cut flow uh column flow uh package and you're at a point where you just don't understand some uh, histogram that's being produced. So what you want to do is run all the tests to produce the awkward array uh, that went into that histogram and then uh, in a notebook. And now that you have that loaded into your notebook cell awkward array, you're just going to you know, slice and dice the data until you can understand what this uh, weird thing is you see in the histogram. How 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 do you sensibly go back about the, uh, doing that in a notebook? Um, for example, exactly like here shown um, shown here with this with this scripting approach. Um, mm -hmm. But this doesn't get an output. Like, how do I turn from that to the parquet file that I need to load into awkward? That looks like it just, you know. Did, for example, you know here. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, wait, I, sorry. Yeah. Oh, you're looking up in the corner. I'm, I apologize. I wasn't looking at that part of the slide. Ah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, okay. I mean, with, here, okay. with notebook, okay, notebook support actually meant yeah. being able okay. to run stuff directly yeah. from here. Yeah, and, so, so you run the task and then you, you, the, the task is triggered and once it's done, you can load it. And so, you know, next time you come back to the notebook, you just re-execute and if somebody updated something upstream. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. No, thanks for your questions. Mm. Uh, thanks. Let's continue with Nick then. Hi there. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, helped me understand a lot more about this. I had one about uh, choosing Fuji. I know that you said you started this several years ago. I wonder at the time, did you consider um, Snake Make or Airflow or others and sort of find that Luigi was the best fit or can you comment a bit on choosing the uh, underlying package? Yeah, so this was at a time where I think Airflow was not fully public yet, um, where I started to base my work on top of Luigi. But I think after two years, I reconsidered switching maybe maybe to Airflow with that. And at that time, at least at, at that time, it, it didn't seem worth the effort because the, the, what I really, as I said in the beginning, liked about Luigi also at that time and also now is that it's really, really so basic. Really explaining this, um, for example, to students or to other people and, and really doing this kind of training is, is just super, super simple. And for example, with SnakeMake, and I also checked out other packages at that time. Yeah, um, it, it didn't feel too Pythonic at that time mm. for example defining requirements um yeah sure i mean also snake make changed really really much a lot during the last i think four years but before then it, it didn't feel like it, yeah it felt like you were you were caught in let's say the framework and it didn't feel that nice gotcha An another question um say maybe slide 13 is good one for this uh, the job submission suppose i ran this command and then maybe after it's submitted to jobs i control c and and then disconnected or my laptop disconnected what does that look like does that mean that i can let the jobs run and when i trigger this law run create cares later that it'll figure out that they're already 
you know, pending jobs. How does, how does that look? Yeah, yeah, this is exactly how it's done. So um, the task would, for example, in this case here, have, have a different outputs here. Now I'm talking about the blue dot, blue dot here, which would correspond to the 26 outputs here. Mm -hmm. So the 26 outputs would be, or the, the outputs of these 26 jobs would be the output of the task here. But in parallel, there are different outputs that are added when you run this as a condo workflow. And in this case, it's the it's a JSON file, for example, with the job IDs. And when this exists already, when starting the task and it's running again, and the JSON file exists, it takes the job IDs from, let's say, the previous run and really first starts polling their status. When it's when they're, when they're reachable, it's just, the job polling just continues. If not, it res, it resubmits. Okay. There are different control outputs uh, for for jobs, particularly for jobs, which which enable there is a smooth transition. Transition. Right. And then for TaskRest with uh, multi-stage um, condor job dependencies, if you were to just leave this running, would it sort of just wait for them all to collect and then submit the, the next sequence of jobs? Or do you um, have to sort of trigger the no, no, next it, layer of jobs manually? It's it's doing this automatically. Okay. I mean, there, there are also different patterns behind there to really to optimize that, but the default is that if a task needs to submit something, it just, it just does it. And when the previous one is done, independent of where Things will run there. It it just submits the jobs. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, thank then, you. Uh, Kaspar. You up next? Yes, I hope my connection is stable enough. Um, it's actually very much close to next question. Um, I am working with Bell, and uh, I did some a workflow tool uh, comparison, um, and I compared Luigi to Snakemake. And actually, the finding was that Snakemake is much uh, more, much easier to use, and also more powerful in in research. So, for instance, um, the whole environment uh, and container uh, support is included uh, very simply in Snakemake. Um, also. Um, considering the syntax is much simpler, I think for someone starting new in workflow management, um, that's easier to start with. So also HDCon support and all that um, is there. And there is a very lively community that supports new profiles and wrappers for new um uh, for new clusters all that um so i'm just wondering whether now that maybe there have been many changes to snake make um one uh, could have a look at that again in general i mean this is very nice i'm just pointing out that snake make also features many of these things uh, built in i'm not sure if you're aware yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, also, I think a, half a year, no, a year ago, there were these comparisons between workflow systems also um, in in the HEP context. Just one question to you, maybe then, what, what do you mean by the syntax is more, is, is easier in, in SnakeMake? I mean, in Luigi, you have to implement in, in these uh, Python classes, right? Which, um, okay, it's not terribly complex, but uh, for someone uh, starting out in, in programming, uh, I mean, SnakeMake, um, on the contrast, you just have uh, something called a rule, and then you write input, and you put just the file name. Um, and um, yeah, you, if you want a container, you just write containerize, and you write the container name. Um, or if you want to access a, uh, a remote location file, it's similar. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, I think in the past, let's say two and a half years, I didn't dive into Snake Make completely my uh, myself. Mm -hmm. From what I remember, though, um, in Snake Make, was that it's sometimes a bit hard to have really, for example, dynamic dependencies being being modeled. 
Yeah, in, so you can have like, like yes. extremely, extremely dynamic behavior, for example, which which container is used at which point, um, which for example, right. which parameters does the choice of the of the container depend on? This was all. And this required some, let's say, non-Pythonic syntax that also, at, at least at that point, I assumed, I mean, people also have to learn that, right? And I think my main motivation for really also at that point staying with Luigi or staying in the Luigi, um, in the Luigi context was that, I mean, it's it's just pure, pure Python at this point and... Yeah. Yes. In, um, this this might be easier. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. There there might be cases, complex use cases where it's reaching limits. Uh, I agree. Um, so for dynamic dependencies, uh, you do have these checkpoints, but uh, maybe they're not as versatile as. Uh, I mean, law probably has some extra features. I haven't checked law uh, in detail. I must admit. Yeah, but so so yeah, just pointing out uh, the findings of this workflow uh, comparison. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I see Nick. You have another question. Yeah, I guess related to the workflow. Do you know the common workflow language specification, or have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm also aware of that. Yep. Yeah, have you? thought at all if, if this Luigi will eventually find its way into the spec? Or do you know what their roadmap is? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure about the Luigi roadmap, but, but um, I mean, from, from my perspective, I mean, from, from the official community, but from my perspective, I think it should be fairly, let's say, mm -hmm. straightforward to have some kind of converter or, or adapter that would just translate into that. Yeah. I think it might be interesting because you could imagine someday that you could have your Luigi export to the CWL. I don't know if that's their official acronym or not. And then you could import it in uh, Rihanna, for example, which purports to uh, conform to the spec. Yep. Which would be kind of fun. Yep. Um, I, I will also put this uh, again on my list. That's uh, for sure interesting. Is there a way actually right now to run on Rihanna resources? I was curious about this too. Uh, at, at least, at least, at least not right now. Okay, thanks, uh, Kaspar. You have another question, and then I think we'll, we'll close so that we're not running too late. Yes, uh, just um, a follow up. Um, uh, so coming back to uh, Snake Make. Um, so as you know, Snake Make can be run on Rihanna. And also, it features support to um, convert to CVL workflows, um, CWL. Um, one thing I think is very powerful is that you can include a scripts with minimal modifications in multiple programming languages. Um, so, if you have an existing analysis and you think you want to move to workflow management. Um, in Luigi, basically, what you have to do is uh, take apart the whole code and put them in classes. Whereas in Snake, mm. you can just call the script and add a line at the top for the input and output file. Um, Sorry, but I, I think this is this is not great. I mean, you don't have to tear apart your, anal your analysis. If you already have them in scripts, I mean, you can also just call the scripts from within your task. You don't have to you don't have to um, move move your move your for example an analysis code implementation into the run methods you can just call stuff from there okay that that is that is correct um do you know whether um Luigi also supports um scripts outside of python um for example I mean, r if I mean, you can use popen, right? So you can, you right. can break out very, very easily in a Pythonic way. And okay, as I said yes. in the beginning, you can really separate workflow definition from your action analysis code. Your analysis code doesn't need to know anything about law or Luigi, but you can still steer it from there. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. 
Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, God, then one last point, and then I think we will yeah, close it's, this it's just a quick point. I'm listening to this debate of, of workflow uh, systems. And you know, there, there are two stages to the analysis. And I think, I think you mentioned, uh, Marcel, at the very beginning, there is this iterative stage. And it, it feels to me like this is where a lot of the power for Luigi comes, especially when you combine it with something like Cutflow, which understands awkward arrays and you know, gets you fairly quickly, uh, assuming all your tasks run quickly, that is, uh, to the point where you can, you can play with that data in, you know, make plots. Whereas the tools, or at least my understanding, which is far from complete, uh, uh, things like uh, snake make and and uh, and these other tools are really they're really built to put together large blocks like running batch jobs and uh, you know running uh, n tuple code and things like that and I think you know that is just sort of the first part of the analysis and frankly I think that part is really well understood that this is all batch jobs and we're doing we've been doing batch jobs certainly since I started doing uh, particle physics, which was, you know, that's about 500 years ago or something. Um, and it's this second part that I think we really need the work where we really need the innovative ideas. Uh, and, and this, you know, the, what you've done with Luigi strikes me as, as one, uh, one possible direction. And it feels like it's really getting away from just the command line and the script uh, part, which you know, I, I really think we need to leave behind. That for, that works very well for the first part of the analysis, but we tend not to spend most of our time in the first part of the analysis, other than we're you know fighting with the grid and, and other things like that. Yeah, thanks, thanks for your comment, and and also also one one comment on that. I mean, also let's call it the heavy lifting part in the beginning of the analysis. I mean, this is all can can be fully covered by that. I know groups which are doing custom uh, Monte Carlo production with law. So this is this is really, I mean, yeah, also of course possible. For example, for my PhD thesis, a couple of years back, um, the the number of really tasks that were doing the heavy lifting because we also had um, uh, manual Monte Carlo production in there. I uh, was in the order of 500 to uh, 400 to 500,000 tasks, which also at some point were running on the grid. So this is can also the first part, as you call it, can be can yeah. be fully covered by that. It's certainly, certainly. It's just that that first part, I think our field knows really well how to break it down. We, this is that first part is something that we have been do doing historically. I, I've been on three four large experiments in my uh my career and the model hasn't changed and you know i started in i don't know what is it 1985 or something like that and the basic model hasn't changed our field really understands this part and yes of course luigi can can do it so snake make can can do it very well as well uh i'm sure uh, as among you know all the other various uh um, uh, workflow languages, including things like Rihanna. It's this last piece now where while, I, you know, you, you, you didn't call it, you, you called the initial part heavy lifting. I mean, from the point of view of getting the task done, tracking the scripts, okay, yes, the CPU time, certainly. But where does a student spend most of their time um, if it's not guarding, you know, grid jobs? It's making histograms, trying to you know, figure out new selection cuts, figure out how to do trainings, how to store the training so other people in the group can use those trainings, that stuff. And I think, you know, there is the place where I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, new ideas. And, I, you know, this is something I think Luigi goes uh, part of the way, or if not most of the way to, to, to uh, solving. And I think that's one of the reasons what, what you've done is so interesting personally. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I agree that personally also, like, I, I definitely want to have a closer look at this and try this out for myself. I will be in touch about the systematics part in particular, because I think this is something where, like, I, I'm always, like, wondering of, like, how to best integrate that uh, into work. Alex, so, Alex yes. did you notice that they were using, uh, he's using correction live? 
<laughs> yes, uh, and also PyHF at the bottom. I will be indeed yeah. <laughs> writing to myself afterwards. There, there's there's more questions I have. Okay, with this, uh, thank you very very much for this very nice presentation for all this work that like really is behind um, all of this project. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and for the discussion. And then with that, I think that's it for today. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks. Very nice work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's great work.